Good morning, Hope Church. So good to be with you guys this morning. I am excited to bring you week four of the message series called Scars. And I told you in week one that we are on a journey together. And um, it's just been so cool just even personally in my own life as we've gone on this, embarked on this journey together, finding freedom in our lives from the things that are holding us back. Um, it was, it's cool to hear your stories. And many of you have shared those stories with us. And I want to just encourage you. If God is, is bringing freedom into your life, we want to hear your story. And uh, that, that's part of how you get victory even is sharing your story. Sometimes sharing your story helps somebody else get victory in their life because of what God is doing in your life. Amen. Amen. And so uh, you can continue to send us those stories at freedom at hopechurchmt.com. Freedom at hopechurchmt.com. I'm excited to bring you this week's message. I, um, I am uh, lamenting a little bit this morning. I had a little bit of a rough weekend uh, on Friday night. The Glacier Wolf Pack lost a heartbreaker, 43 to 41, to uh, Missoula Big Sky. But their, their, their playoff ch- chances are still, there's still hope. Like, like there's, there's a slim chance. That, but it's out of their hands now. It's in somebody else's hands. I love it. Kind of like Dumb and Dumber. You mean I have a chance? Yes, <laughs> there is there's still a chance. And then my New York Yankees lost to the Houston Astros, and they will not be going to the World Series to win a 28th World Series championship, most championship of any sport team in history. Uh, just throwing that in there. Uh, so it was a little bit of a rough sports weekend for me. I'm lamenting a little bit. I'm hoping that the New York Giants will um, redeem my weekend by beating the Seattle Seahawks. Come on. Yeah, with some Giant fans around, man. Awesome. I love that. Hey, uh, a couple things before we get into the message this morning. This whole message series has led up to this last week here. And we built that on purpose for you, realizing that it's, it's been so cool. Even, even in between services, I had a lady tell me, I asked her, I said, man, how you doing? So I know she's been going through some things. And she said, I'm alive and I'm here. And even for some of you, you you may feel the same way. It's like, yeah, I'm alive, I'm breathing, and I'm here. Isn't it good that you just made it sometimes to church, right? Sometimes we make it through, uh, you know, the skin of our teeth. But you made it here, and you're positioning yourself for God to do something impossible in your life and to bring freedom. Because we still serve a God that does the impossible. You know that, right? That's why we're here. Every time you show up, you give God a chance to do something impossible in your life. And I love that we serve a God that still does the impossible. Amen? But oftentimes, the way he works is it's in a process. And it's in a journey. And we set up this whole month that we've called Freedom Month with the culmination of this week and today's message. And we got next week to end it. We have a really special um, message. I don't want to ruin it for you, but you're going to want to be here. It's going to be amazing. But this weekend, we have what we call our Freedom Weekend. And you know, Freedom Weekend is a Friday evening and it's a Saturday. And you could sign up for that weekend back at our Connect Center. And um, on that weekend, it's a series of, of teachings on six different areas in our life that we can get stuck or we can be held back from uh, becoming the people that God has called us to be and getting freedom from uh, those things that are holding us back in our relationship with God, in our relationship with other people. It's a series of teachings, and we're going to have some prayer time. We have an amazing prayer team that's going to be here, and you get to have some prayer encounters where God will do something amazing and set you free. I've heard so many testimonies. Let me tell you this. I told told somebody who was kind of thinking about, "Ah, I'm kind of on the fence. Should I go to this weekend or not? I said, look, I could tell you this about it. I have yet to have one single person say, that was a complete waste of my weekend. No, to the contradictory, every time that I've asked somebody, what would you think about the weekend? Man, it was amazing. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. And uh, some people, they get radically set free. Other people, it, it, it really just takes you to that next step of freedom. Where God can continue that process. And so we're on a journey together. Next Sunday night, we're, we're going to kind of cap the whole thing off with something we've never done before. But we're calling it Power Night. And Power Night is where I'm going to give a teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is the most amazing gift that Jesus promised. He said, I'm going to send you a helper. And I believe that oftentimes... 
The problem in our, in our Christian life is that we don't have enough power to overcome these, these past history, our hurts, and our habits in our life because we're missing this incredible gift that Jesus gave us. And so I want to encourage you. Maybe you've heard that term before. You've heard us talk about it here at Hope Church. We firmly believe that the power of the Holy Spirit in our life is what enables us to live a righteous and holy life. It is a gift that we need. And so we don't want to just clean the house. The Bible talks about, hey, what do you do when you, give, when you tie up a strong man? So there's some strongholds in our life that God is getting rid of. And as he's freeing us up from those, those things, whether it's our history, our hurts, or our habits, as we're getting free and we're kind of cleaning our spiritual house, so to speak, we don't want to leave you with an empty house. You need to fill it with the Holy Spirit. And so I want to encourage you, come next Sunday night. It's going to be a great time together. I'm going to give a teaching. And then we're going to pray. We're going to have a prayer team here to pray for anybody who wants to receive this amazing gift. So, all right. Are you guys ready to get into the word this morning? Yeah. I'm excited for it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to have it on the screen here. If you don't happen to have your Bible or your electronic device where you read your Bible, I'm going to read out of the New International Version this morning. And I love the title of this passage of Scripture. The title is No Confidence in the Flesh. No confidence in the flesh. I love the Apostle Paul. Today we're going to take a look at this, arguably the greatest apostle in the whole New Testament. The one who were, I th wrote, I think, three quarters of the New Testament himself. The great Apostle Paul who many of us we look up to, we put on a, a pedestal in Christian realms. And yet this Apostle Paul, he went through some things in life. You see, oftentimes... We think that God's blessing on our life is that we live a blessed life where, where we're pain free. And we don't have to go through adversity. We don't have to go through trials. We don't have to be exposed to temptations. We're going to see today, we're going to hear from the great apostle Paul who he's gone through some things in his life. He's got some scars to prove it. And what he's saying to us this morning is that it's not the lack of scars in my life that proves God's love and blessing and faithfulness to me. It's actually the scars that prove that God loves me and his faithfulness to me and his blessing on my life. See, Paul had a different, he had a different perception of the things that he went through in his life, the places where he had been wounded, the trials that he went through. He didn't look back on them, which most of us tend to do, and be offended at God. God, why did you have to let me go through that? Why do I have to go through what I'm going through? Why the wounds? And it's a question that you and I need to settle. And Paul settled them in his heart. He counted them as a blessing, not a curse from God. And he looked at it as God's love for him and his faithfulness to, to him was allowing him to go through some adversity in his life. And he had the battle scars to prove it. And now we're going to see Paul is rolling up his sleeves. He's getting a little vulnerable. And he's saying, listen, it's not that I've been unscathed in life. It's that I've got some scars. And I want to, I want to roll up my sleeves. And I want to show you that, those scars. Because I believe that God wants to take our scars and to turn them into something beautiful. Yeah. And he wants to use them for his purpose and for his glory. But we got to get some things straight this morning if we're going to allow God to turn our scars into something beautiful. So Paul says this. He begins this letter. He says, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I, I believe, and, and as I was reading this, I didn't even put this or plan this in my notes. But this morning, I believe that joy is a choice. That you need to choose to rejoice in the Lord. No matter what you're going through. This is why worship is so critical in getting breakthrough. Worship is warfare. It is spiritual warfare. And anytime you engage in worship, you're saying, I don't care how I feel. I know I've got wounds. I know I've got scars. But I'm willing to worship God and I'm willing to rejoice in the fact that God is good. And I stand on the fact that God is good. And I will rejoice. And I will be glad in it. Come on, somebody needs to get happy. You remember like the Partridge family? Come on, get happy. A whole lot of loving. Come on, can't you just see those little partridges, different colors, dancing and getting on that bus? Cassidy with his hair slicked back, that good-looking guy. Now he's all jacked up. But hey, you know what? Sometimes that's what fame and fortune does to you, right? The things that we think are a blessing in life, 
Come on, and get some plastic surgery so you walk around looking surprised the rest of your life. <laughs> right? Hey, man, I'm 80 years old, but I am still full of surprise in life. <laughs> Just saying. Back to Paul. <laughs> Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Come on, it's time to get happy because we're on the verge of freedom, y'all. We're about to break through, okay? And he says, it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard to you. I'm going to explain to you what Paul means, but, but he's trying to protect them from this false doctrine that is trying to infiltrate them and wrong, wrong thinking that started to creep into the church. And so he goes on to say, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. You see, there was some in the church, just like there is some in the church today, that want you to get out of this place of grace and start getting back into the law. You see, these, these, these teachers, they were trying to, to get them to be circumcised again, which was the law. It was an outward expression of something that God wanted to do on the inside. You see, Jesus talked about that there's a circumcision of the heart. Jesus was trying to take everything that the religious leaders of the day, he said, look, you're really good at cleaning the outside of the cup, but the inside of the cup is dirty. It's ugly inside of there. You want to look good on the outside, you got robes on the outside flowing, you got crowns on the outside, you got all kinds of stuff on the outside, but on the inside you got some ugly wounds. And, and what, what these religious leaders were trying to do is, is force them to go back to the law, to get out of grace, which is we're going to see the power of God is in his grace. And trying to get them to do this outward circumcision. And what God was after is he's after the heart. You see, in this whole process of freedom, what he's after the most is your heart. He wants to come with the scalpel and he's, it's like he's doing open heart surgery on us. He's, we've been under the knife, y'all. And he wants to cut away the things that are, have attached to your heart. That are holding your heart back from being free to pump the blood that gives life to your body. There's things when, 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 when our wounds don't get healed, they hold back the flow of blood and the life that God wants to impart to us. And we're not free to be the people we, we want to be. And I believe that's one of the reasons why the church and the Christian life can become anemic. Because we're not getting enough life pumping through our blood because we have a heart problem. And God wants to come and he wants to circumcise our heart. He wants to cut away the things that have attached to our heart. And so Paul says, I put no confidence in the flesh. In other words, in my own ability to get free, in my own ability to be strong, in my own ability to be an overcomer, I don't put any confidence there. I have, even though he says, I have reason if I wanted to, to have confidence. And why, Paul? Why do you have such reason to be confident? If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. So now Paul is showing us his badges. And we're, later we're going to see his bruises. Do you know that the word mark, Paul, Paul says that I, have the, I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus on my back. That's because he took, thir he took 39 lashes. He took the same amount of lashes on his back. He was flogged. He was, he was beaten. He was bruised. In the name of the Lord Jesus, and he had the marks on his back to prove it. You know, that word mark is an interesting word. On one hand, it, it means a badge. It's like a badge of honor. Like I've got, I've got good marks, marksmanship. On the other hand of the definition, it means a scar, a flaw, a bruise. So on one hand, Paul, Paul is saying, yeah, I've got some bruises. I've been through some things. I got some scars. I got the marks on my body to prove it. But I also got some badges. I also got some, some areas where I can look at and show you my credentials. And that's what Paul is getting into. He's starting to show his creds. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Now, come on, somebody. How many of you have ever used that one to uh, prove your worthiness? I was <laughs> circumcised on the eighth day. 
How do you like me now? <laughs> of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for, now look at this one, underline this one. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. In other words, perfect. You see, the way we look at perfection and part of what I want to get across to you this morning, because I believe that oftentimes it's our feeling of, of imperfection that gives us feelings of insecurity, isn't it? Like, it's easy that we started this thing in grace. In fact, Paul was admonishing one of the churches, who bewitched you? I think it was the Galatians. Who bewitched you to think that what started in grace, that now you can go back to the law? And that's exactly what the teachers of the day were trying to get them to do. How many of you know when you're trying to live up to a standard that you get tight? Like, i got to be careful even in preaching that I'm not, I'm not up here trying to please you. Or I'm not trying to, by being up here and preaching to you, win your approval or your affection through my preaching. I'm not up here for me. I'm up here for you. And anytime I start getting tight or I feel nervous about preaching, one of the things that I have to do is I have to give that, I have to take it. And just like we sang this morning, i got to put it back on the altar and say, God, i got to be reminded of why I do this. It isn't about me. It's about you. And so how I get myself out of perfection or trying to perform is I start to think about you. I start to think about how you come every week and you've got things and wounds in your life and you're hurting and you're desperate and you're losing hope. And, and then my heart starts to break for you and I start to think it's not about me. It's about you. It's about how God will speak through me and the power of the Holy Spirit will speak through me to you. And how he'll use that to set you free and to bring truth into your heart that will set you free. But we can get tight, can't we? Anytime we're held up to this standard and people are trying to hold the people of God in this passage up to a higher standard. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Don't go back there. We don't want to get into performance mode. We don't want to get into perfectionism. We don't go want to get back into trying to follow all the right rules and do all the right things. Because I'll tell you what, the law brings death, but it is the spirit that brings life. So you're called to walk in the spirit, not in the letter of the law. And so he goes on and he gives all his badges, his credos, his creds, his street cred. And then listen to what he says. He says, but you know what? Forget all that. Because you know why? He says, but whatever were gains to me, even though I was perfect and I was faultless and you couldn't find anything wrong with me, he says, that, even though I thought all that stuff was going to make me perfect in the sight of God, all it did was show my insecurity. And he goes on to say, now I consider what all those things that I thought were gain, I now consider the loss for sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is in faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And listen to what he says in verse 10. And you want to underline this. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. Now look at what Paul puts together. You want to know the power of his resurrection. How does that translate to you and me? We've got dead things in our life, spiritually speaking. In other words, there's things in our life that are not life-giving to us. They're life-draining. They're life-sucking. And you know those things. I don't know what yours are, but I know what mine are, that when I let those dead things stay in my life, they suck the life right out of me. They want to hold me back and keep me in this place where I'm ineffective in my ministry. I'm ineffective as a dad, as a husband, as a friend, as a minister. And we got to deal with these dead things. And how does how did Paul say we deal with them? I want to know the power of his life-giving resurrection. We all want that power. We want to be able to overcome, but we don't want to go through anything in the process to get there. And Paul says the prerequisite for knowing the power of his resurrection is this, and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. 
See, we don't want to have to go through anything. We don't want to have to suffer. But we want the power. And Paul's saying, you want the life-giving power to get free? You want the life-giving power to live the life that God is calling you to? You just might have to participate in a few sufferings, just like Jesus did to get there. And then he goes on to this in verse 12. And I love it. Paul summarizes this whole passage by saying, not that I have already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal. Now that word goal right there, um, that word goal can be, uh, oh, shoot, I, I lost it. Come on now. That word goal can also be translated, bear with me. Come on, pray for me, Pastor Lance. you got to get this word. It can be translated strength. And he goes on to say this. He goes on to say, not that I have arrived. No, I'm sorry, not strength, perfection. That's a, forgive me. Will you guys forgive me? Brain, pray for me. Not that I've already arrived at perfection, but I press on to take a hold of what Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet having taken hold of it, but this one thing that I do, forgetting what is behind, straightening what, towards what is ahead, I press on to take hold uh, to, toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to every heart. God, I pray that we would be able to put away the distractions and that we would give our full attention to you in this next 20 minutes, God. We surrender our will, our mind, and our emotions to you right now. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would not allow us to leave this place the same that we came in. God, I pray that you set your people free this morning. I pray that your truth in the inward parts would help people to get free of the lies that we believed in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 How many of you guys have heard of this, uh, this pop song called, My Scars to My Beautiful? Scars to My Beautiful by Alessia Cara. Anybody? Anybody heard that? Y'all need to get with the times a little bit. All the young people over here are like, yeah, I heard, I heard that. It's a top, it's top 40 song, an amazing, amazing song written by an amazing young lady. She's actually 20 years old. She started singing uh, professionally when she was about 14 years old. And um, it's an awesome song. In fact, I want to read some of the lyrics to you because I think um, the lyrics are really, really powerful. I, w I want you to listen to this. Title of the song, Scars to Your Beautiful. By the way, it's also the title of my message, Scars to Your Beautiful. She says this, she just wants to be beautiful. She goes unnoticed. She knows no limits. She craves attention. She praises an image. She prays to be sculpted by the sculptor. Oh, she don't see the light that's shining deeper than the eyes can find it. Maybe we have made her blind. So she tries to cover up her pain and cut her woes away because cover girls don't cry after their face is made. But there's a hope that's waiting for you in the dark. You should know you're beautiful just the way you are. And you don't have to change a thing. The world could change its heart. No scars to your beautiful. We're stars and we're beautiful. And then, in and then the next verse it says, what's a little bit of hunger? I could go a little bit longer. She fades away while she don't see her perfect. She don't understand she's worth it. Or that beauty goes deeper than the surface. So to all the girls that's hurting, let me be your mirror. Help you to see a little bit clearer that light that shines within. There's a hope waiting for you in the dark. You should know you're beautiful just the way you are. And you don't have to change a thing. The world could change its heart. No scars to your beautiful. We're stars and we're beautiful. This, this song, I love stories behind a song. And oftentimes we hear a song like that and there's a story behind the song. And the story behind the song, I was reading an interview that... Um, I don't know, some magazine did with her entertainment magazine. And, and what she said was amazing because they noticed whenever she performs this song, she actually performs it without makeup on. And what you don't know, sometimes we idolize people. And we, don't, we don't even know the scars that they have and the things that they've gone through. And this girl, 14 years old, her mother was a hairdresser. And so very early age, she used to do experiment with different hairdos and, and dye her hair and straighten her hair. She hated her curly, frizzy hair. And so she used to get her mom's flat iron and, you know, flatten her. I don't know how you girls do all that stuff, but you know how to do it. And, uh, you know, straighten it out. And she'd straighten it so many times and had curled it so many times and dyed it so many times. 
I don't know what she did to her hair, but she said all of a sudden clumps of hair would just fall out of her head. And she would have these massive, like, bald spots. Think about being a 14-year-old girl where beauty in, in this world is everything. And, you know, I was reading about how, how teenagers, in particular teenage girls, but teenagers in, um, in particular are, are going through, the, the psycho, psychologists cannot believe the percentage of teens that have psychological disorders. The amount of anxiety and depression that teens are, are getting counseled for and getting prescription drugs for is like at an all-time high. And one of the things that they're finding out, and often um, girls and boys, because they look at these images and they read Cosmo magazine and they, on social media puts all these beautiful pictures of beautiful women and, and guys that look like they got it all together. And they, they start thinking that they're, they're so far from that image of what beauty looks like that they see all the flaws and the faults and the scars and the wounds in themselves and they start to hate themselves. When they look in the mirror, they start to say, I hate you. And, and they start cutting themselves and putting scars even on their own body to ease the pain of knowing that they'll never measure up to this standard that the world has and has put on, on people for living up to this outward appearance, this perfection, and this identity that everybody is trying to go to. And, and this Alicia Cara who wrote this song, Scars to Your Beautiful, um, she writes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you a quote from, from this interview that she did. She said, um, she started doing her hair to the side in different hairstyles to kind of cover up these bald spots. And then eventually she got to a place where she couldn't even do it anymore. And she said this. She said, I didn't want people to look at me. I didn't want people to get too close. I think oftentimes what prevents us from getting the freedom in our own lives is that we don't want to show our scars. We don't want to show our weaknesses. We don't want to show the areas where, where we're stuck and we're wounded and we're hurt and we're in trouble and our bad habits, we try to hide and cover those things up. And what Paul is trying to tell us is say, listen, you get freedom not from trying to cover those things up or pretending like everything's good. Where the freedom comes is when you let your weaknesses be known and you let God cover your weaknesses with his strengths. It's this thing called grace. And we could get into this place where we stop even coming to church and we stop going to connect group and we stop integrating with other people because if they get too close, they might see my scars. They might see that I'm ugly. You know, one of the most beautiful things about marriage, I believe, is that it teaches us to love unconditionally. There is nothing more beautiful in this life when you get close enough to somebody that they can see all your faults, all your scars, all your wounds, all your jacked up stuff, and in the middle of it, they love you anyway. There's nothing more beautiful than that. It's this thing called unconditional love. And when you feel it, there's something so liberating and so humbling about somebody else seeing all the worst of you, all your scars, and saying, you know what? You're beautiful just the way you are. You are beautiful because I see something deeper in you that other people don't see on the outside. Because what we have to understand is that the world is trying to conform you to the pattern of this world and what it believes. It will try to get you stuck in this trap that beauty comes from the outside. I'm here to liberate you from that lie this morning and to remind you that beauty doesn't come from the outside. Beauty comes from within. Beauty is something that flows through you and out of you. I've met some really pretty girls that were really ugly girls. They're gorgeous on the outside, but I wouldn't want to spend five minutes with them because of this ugliness that just exuded from them. Just something about you just is not attractive. On the flip side, I've met some, some women who would be considered ordinary looking, but they were extremely attractive because of this beauty that they, and this confidence that they possessed was not just in themselves, but their beauty was because it flowed out of a relationship with Jesus and they had confidence in knowing who God was to them and who they were to God. Yeah. And that beauty flowed out of that. Listen, the Bible says in Isaiah 53 about this person called Jesus that there was nothing attractive to about him. 
There was nothing beautiful about this man named Jesus, yet the multitudes, crowds followed him. Why? Because there was this beauty that came out of him that when you looked in his eyes, you knew love just poured forth from, from him to you. Everywhere he went, he brought truth and healing and power and life, and he cared for those who everybody else forgot. The unwanted, everybody else, the, the Pharisees, they say, they didn't even mess with people that had flaws. In fact, you know what they did with people who had flaws? They put them out, they stuck them outside the city gate. They said, you guys, you're not even welcome here, you're rejected, we can't even touch you, you are ceremonially unclean. Therefore, you are cast out of society. You're overlooked and you're cast out. And you know what Jesus did, this beautiful man named Jesus, he said, come to me. All you who are weary, all you who are outcast. He said, give me the broken, give me the poor, give me the wounded, give me the scarred up, chewed up, spit out of society. Bring them to me because I will love them. And it was that love that made him beautiful. The most beautiful person that ever walked the face of this earth. And so we've got to change the way we look at ourselves and the way we look at God because I believe that how we think about ourselves oftentimes is the very thing that keeps us bound. Because how you think and the thoughts that you entertain and what you believe to be true determines how you feel. Determine, and and what, how you feel determines what you do. Right? So we got to get this, this head right if we're going to get free of these things that we've been conditioned by this world. Look at Romans. Um, and, and let me give you the big idea. The big idea of this whole message is this. The lies we believe create the feelings we feel. The lies that we believe create the feelings that we feel. And feelings are powerful. Emotions are powerful. They keep us bound. They keep us in this place of feeling insecure, that we have to be perfect. Let me tell you something. This journey for me as a pastor, talk about showing some scars. Is it okay if I tell you about some of my scars this morning? When I said yes to the call of God in my life and I became pastor of this church, greatest day in my life, most honoring thing that I've ever done. But I can tell you this, I, I used to be in business and I was very successful in business. I, I, I made good money in business. I, I was looked up to, I was respected in business and I was enjoying my life. And by the way, I was also serving in the church. I was part of our leadership team served in just about every area of this church. So it wasn't like I was just kicking it back, you know, and calling it good. I was pursuing the things that God had for me. But at the same time, after being a pastor for two years, I kind of got in this little bit of a funk. And you wouldn't know this because I was kind of dealing with this, you know, behind closed doors, so to speak. But this was something that I was wrestling with and struggling with. After about two years, I, I got into a little bit of a place where I started feeling depressed, I started feeling um, really insecure, like super insecure, and I started feeling like I was pressing a little bit. You know, when you start to feel insecure, you start to press a little bit. Like you try harder, you work harder, you try to, you know, cover up your fault, you try to like say, I can get through this, I just need to try harder. I need, I need to build more strength and do it. And I kept asking the Lord in this season, like, what is going on inside of me? I don't even understand it. And then the Lord started speaking truth to me, and I, he started showing me that, Lance, your identity was so wrapped up in who you were as a businessman and how successful you were there, and now you're in a place where your success is completely dependent on what I say about you. It's not dependent upon somebody saying, oh, good message, Pastor Lance, or, or I love this church, Pastor Lance, or, or you're doing an amazing work, Pastor Lance. It's none of that stuff. It's what I say about you that matters most. And so I want you to live for an audience of one. And I went through this season and this process where I had to let God do a deeper work in me and unravel and show me that I was so wrapped up and tied up, my security even though I didn't realize it was how well I could provide for a family as a man. Like I took, I mean, come on. What man doesn't want to provide really well for his family? And I used to be able to provide really well for my family. Now I'm completely dependent on what God provides to give to my family. 
even though I know in my own strength and ability I could go out and I could provide a good living for my family so they could have things that they want to have that I can't provide for them. And I had to let go of those things, who I thought I was, the insecurity that I had, and I had to find my identity in Christ. But it all started with believing lies. The first step, Romans 12, 2 says this, because the world wants to put things on you. You've got to be successful, pastor. Come on, you got to, you got to, this is what, this is the world's view, right? I'm just talking to you straight. You got to grow the church. And, and my, my badges are how big the church grows and how successful the ministry is and how many people love it. But that's not necessarily God's standard and measure for success. See, the world looks at the outside, but the Bible says that God looks at the heart of man. And we got to get to the heart of God and begin to uncover the lies that we've been believing about who God is and who we are in him. And let go of those things so that those feelings, we could be freed from those feelings that are holding us back. Those insecurities and that performance mentality. So Romans 12, 2 says this. Here's a key. That if we're going to get free, the Bible says that it is the truth that sets you free. That's point number one. It is the truth that sets you free. And just like Jack Nicholson sitting on the stand while he's got Tom Cruise grilling him, right? You don't want to know the truth. You can't handle the truth. Listen, sometimes the truth is painful, but until we're willing to get real with ourselves about the things that are holding us back and we're willing to let the truth of God speak to our hearts about where we're at and what we're engaged in and, and how it's hurting us, we're never going to get free. we got to let that truth get in the inward parts. It says the truth will set you free. So Romans 12, 2 says this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Listen, the pattern of this world wants to try to keep you bound into this place of thinking that it's on you. You got to be perfect. You got to be successful. You got to be free. You got to be the one to make all this happen. And he says, but you are changed. Let me break that down for you. You are set free when your mind begins to be renewed and then you'll be able to test and approve God's will and his good and pleasing and perfect will. Listen, the word of God is the most powerful weapon to dispel the lies that you've been believing. This is why you, you got to understand something, that when you read the Bible, you're just not reading a history book. You are, you are reading a freedom manual. Because every time you read the truth, you're reading about how much God loves you, how much he cared for you, that he so loved you that he sent his only son to die for you, and that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That he knew you in your mother's womb, that he formed and fashioned you, and he knows every hair on your head, and he had good works planned for you long ago. When you read the word, the truth starts to get in you, and it, and it reminds us of the things that we've let in, the little subtle lies. You see, the enemy is a liar. He is a deceiver, and he doesn't work with big flashing lights. He just gets in with little subtle white lies that you begin to believe about yourself. In the first service, I can't pick on him this service because he ain't doing it. But the first service, Pastor Justin was on his phone and he was texting. And, and Sammy and Caroline were sitting over here and they were laughing. And he was laughing. And, and I, I used it as a, an example of how even in that moment, my mind could start thinking, they're, they're laughing at me. They don't value me. They're making fun of me. This is my staff. They don't even honor me. I'm sitting up here preaching and they're, they're, they're making fun of something that I did or didn't do. And all these thoughts could start working over in my mind. And all of a sudden, I could start to feel that I'm not valuable enough. I'm not honored enough in this church. What, I should just quit and go back to my old job because you know what? If I was being really effective in ministry, they would value me more. They wouldn't be on their phone texting during the middle of service. They would be hanging on every word I say, <laughs> right? And all these lies start running around in my head and I start thinking all those thoughts. And when I start agreeing with those lies, then the feelings of inferiority and the insecurity start coming over me. And then I feel this pressure that I need to perform. I need to preach better. I need to do something better. I don't know what I need to do. I need to do a jig up here, get, keep people's attention. I don't know what I got to do, but I got to do something better. I got to be better because obviously I'm not enough the way I am. You see how that works? 
And the word of God needs to get in us to remind us of who God is and who we are in him. The second thing is this. The second key to freedom this morning is that we need to trust God in the process. Listen, freedom is a process. And we need to learn to trust God in the process. Part of the process is us learning that we need to let go of trying to do it in our own strength and learn to trust God to provide everything we need to make us strong in our weaknesses. Come on, look what Paul says. Paul been through some things. He'd been through some shipwrecks. He'd been through a lot of stuff. And, and this is what he had to say about being in one of those shipwrecks that wounded him. He said, for I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired of even life itself. And some of you have gone through some things and you've gotten to a place where you, you started despairing of even life itself. Like, I don't even know if I can make it another day. I don't know if I want to make it another day if life has got to be like this. And look at what Paul says. He gives us a key. He says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we, listen here, here's the key, that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. He says, who delivered us from such a great of death? Anybody here this morning been delivered from such a great of death? We should be dead and buried, but instead, because God so loved us, he gave, he gave his only son to die on the cross so we could have forgiveness of sins, and that our old life could be dead and buried with Christ, and we could raise to new life in him. All things have passed away. Guess what? All things have become new. Come on, Paul, preach to us this morning. I'm pressing forward. I'm leaving some things behind because I know that God's got some better things ahead for me. He's turning my scars into something beautiful. But I got to learn in the process, God is trying to teach me some things and what he's trying to train you to trust. He's trying to train you to trust. Listen, I love David. Listen, if you're going to confront some giants in your life, you got to confront him. You remember the story of David? Story of David, he shows up on the scene. Somebody gave him some lunch. Gave, his dad gave him a lunch to take, take to the real soldiers. I love the story of David because when Samuel went to pick a new king, he had all of David's sons line up. David's own father didn't even think of David enough to put him in the lineup. He was out tending the sheep. And he lined up all his best. And even Samuel started going down the line. And he sees the one that's six foot four, good looking, big, strong. And he said, surely it must be him. And then God says to Samuel, Samuel, you look at the outside, but I look at the heart. And he says, no, it's none of these guys. Do you have another? I love that God uses the overlooked people to do some of the most amazing things. And some of you, you feel like you've been overlooked your whole life. And God is saying, no, even though other people might overlook you, I've never overlooked you. I've always believed in you. You've always been my son. You've always been my daughter. And David, he gives David the little lunchbox to take to the, to the real soldiers. And David shows up on the scene and all the, the soldiers are lined up on both sides of the battlefield. And David shows up, and he's like, what's going on, guys? And they're like, this giant, he's been taunting us for 40 days. Listen, the enemies in your life, if you don't take them down, they will continue to taunt you and haunt you and remind you of how puny you are, how overlooked you are, how weak you are, how all the faults in your life are going to keep you back from ever doing anything great. And they started to believe it. And because they started to believe it, they started to feel fear and insecurity. What if I step out and this guy takes me out? And that same fear is crippling some of you from stepping out in faith into the person that God has called you to be. And David doesn't understand why they're so insecure and held back by fear, what, that it's holding them back from gaining a victory. And so he says, listen, let me get a shot at, let me take a crack at this guy. How dare he say those things? And then his brothers say, get out of here. 
You just wanted to come here and stir up trouble. Like they, they were making fun of him, belittling him. I love that David at that point, he could have said, you know, he could have believed the lie and said, you're right. I don't belong here. I'm not worthy. I'm just, a, I'm just a young guy. What do I got on this guy? I can't do that thing. But no, he says, I can do it. And when he goes to Saul to pitch to the king why he should be the one to go out, I love what he says. He says, <laughs> even Saul says, you're just a boy and he's a man. How are you going to beat him? And he says, let me tell you something. This is how I'm going to beat him. Because when I went through the trial, out when I was all by myself in a dark place, out in the field, when there was a bear that would come and attack me, and challenged me, I killed it. When there was a lion that would come, I took it out. And, and he, he, this is what I love that he says. He says, I've killed the bear, I've killed the lion. In other words, I've made it through some things in my life. I got the scars to prove it. Don't think for a minute that David didn't have some bear claw marks on his back, that he didn't have some fangs in his side from, from where the, the mountain lion got him, but he, he got victory. He had some scars from those battles, but he says, listen, he says, my God delivered me from the bear, and the lion is the same God that will deliver me from this giant. And you got to be willing to face the giant in your life dead on. You don't need to try to fight all the battles at once. You'll get too overwhelmed, but you need to fight the one that's in front of you, the one that's taunting you the most. And so what, what's the very next thing that happens? Saul says, all right, you're on. Let me give you my, my armor. And David says, after he tries to put on Saul's armor, he says, this doesn't fit me. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you, young people, something. The world's clothes do not fit you. The way the world will try to protect you and me, it doesn't fit us. We don't need that armor. I've got my God that's got my back. He's the one that's my protector. He's the one that's my provider. I'll put my trust and hope in him. But the world will try to tell you, you need you need this, you need to look good on the outside, you need this protection on the outside of you. And God says, I've got your rear guard, I'm gonna be on your left and I'm gonna be on your right and I'm gonna be on your rear and by the way, I'm gonna whisper in your ear the way you should go. And so David takes, here, you keep your armor, Saul. And he steps out onto that battlefield and you know what he says to the giant? He says, you come at me with a sword and a spear and a shield, and I come at you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. David knew where his hope came from. He knew where his strength came from. He knew who his deliverer was. Why? Because he learned how to trust in the process. What you're going through right now, God is trying to get you to trust him in the process. It's the trust. All right, I'm gonna give you these last two super quick. I'm already behind, forgive me. The third one is God is the goal. God is the goal. We think perfection is the goal. We think that we got to be perfect, that we got to do all the right things and say the right things, that we can't have these wounds and these flaws in our life, that somehow we've got to get back into the law. Like, we got to do this thing, man. We got to make it happen. I can't have weaknesses. I can't, I can't have these thorns in my side. And, and Paul says this. He says, if I got to lose everything, and in the process, if I gain the thing that matters most, if I gain God, look, freedom, you just don't even, for, you'll get freedom if you get God. Sometimes we focus on these things. If you just get a hold of God, you get freedom because God is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is liberty. And look what he says in the next verse. And we all, who with unveiled faces, let me show you my scars. Let me show you my wounds. Let me show you my insecurities. Let me show you the things that I'm afraid that if you see, you won't love me and God won't love me and I gotta cover them up and I gotta perform and, and I gotta try to get some security by you, by you telling me I'm okay and that you, you like me and we're good and you're not gonna reject me. But when I take off the mask and I take off the makeup, and I contemplate, in other words, when I look and stop focusing on all my wounds and my flaws and my limitations, and I start focusing on God's strength and God's grace and God's forgiveness, and I look into his eyes and I see how much he loves me, this is why you need to know that God loves you. You don't need to just know it up here, you need to know it right here. 
And I love what Job says. Job, after going through everything, he lost everything. But in the process of, of losing everything, he gained the most invaluable thing that you can never put a price on in this life. Job says, I had before, I'm, I'd heard about you. In other words, you could come to church, you could hear about how much God loves you. You could read the verses in the Bible. You could hear about it with your ears. But then Job says, but now I see you with my own eyes. I know you now. I lost a lot of things, just like you've lost a lot of things. Some of you are in the process of losing a lot of things. But in the process of losing it, if you gain God, listen, God is the goal. When you get him and when you know him and you really know him, it won't matter so much what's happening around you. It won't matter how much you, you feel like you're jacked up and you're never going to be the person that God has called you to be. Because when you get a hold of God, you have everything. He changes us look at him and his righteousness one degree at a time one step at a time as we contemplate the Lord's word we are being changed into his image in ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit what does that mean for you and me today it means that every time we start looking at the goodness of God and we're willing to worship in the middle of the wound and we declare the goodness of God we're being changed a little bit more into his image we're getting a little bit more free and a little bit more free. The last one is this. You guys can stand with me as we close. Don't pick the scab. Don't pick the scab. Too many of us in the process, we get stuck. We feel like this isn't working. And we abort the process because the scab hurts. The scab itches. The scab is irritating, but you'll miss out on the healing if you pick the scab because it's the scab that protects you during the healing process. I've met too many people that they pick the scab in the middle of the process, God is healing them, and because they pick the scab, they have a bigger scar. You need to let God do what he wants to do with you, no matter the cost. Listen. I'm going to end with this. Freedom will cost you something. Freedom will cost you something. It isn't free. Jesus paid for freedom with his blood. Freedom isn't free. It cost him everything to pay the price for freedom for you. And it will cost you something. You know what it will cost you? It will cost you moving your schedule to get here on Friday night and Saturday. It will cost you maybe losing some friends because you're too focused, man. I got to get to Jesus. Let me tell you something. Anybody who got healing in the Bible and got freedom in the Bible, they it always cost them something. The woman with the issue of blood, she knew that life was draining out of her and she needed to get to the source of life and there was a crowd around Jesus. It was going to cost her something. She was going to get humiliated in the process, but she made a determination. I am going to get to Jesus no matter what it costs me. I don't care if I lose everything in the process, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. And you know what Jesus said? He said, I feel power went out of me. When you get to Jesus, your weakness turns to strength, and he takes your scars, and he makes them into something beautiful. He says, woman, your faith has made you well. I want you to just lift your hands here and redeem the lights. Some of you, even in your own insecurity, you haven't come forward for prayer. You haven't signed up for this weekend because you're so consumed with fear and insecurity of how other people will perceive you. If God forbid that you step forward to receive prayer, oh man, they're going to think something's wrong with me. How bad do you want to be free? How bad do you want to be free? Because God gives you a choice. Do you want to stay where you are? Do you want to stay trapped in that place that you're stuck, that you've been stuck in? Or is today the day of freedom? The Spirit of the Lord is here, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I'm going to ask the prayer team just to come up front here. And as we close and as we worship, 
I want you to worship like you never before. Because sometimes it's in the middle of the wounding when we're willing to trust God and worship Him that the greatest healing is released in our life. So come on, church. Begin to lift up your voice. Knowing I'm found in Christ, in your life. 